Hello, and thank you very much for joining this webinar session from the Austrian Association for Legal Linguistics on Language, Law and the Brain. My name is Katie Bray, I'll be moderating this session. And speaking with us today, we have the AALL's own Daniel Green. Daniel holds a BA in English and American Studies, an MA in English Language and History from the University of Vienna, and an LLM from the University of Edinburgh. He now specializes in applied legal linguistics, statutory interpretation, legislative drafting, and the role of linguistic indeterminacy in Austrian criminal proceedings. Hello, Daniel. And also joining us today is Franz R. Schmidt. Franz holds a master's degree in brain and cognition from the Bombo Fabra University, Barcelona, a master's degree in general and cognitive linguistics from the University of Vienna, and in the past, he's worked at the Medical University of Vienna's Neuroimaging Labs and at the Max Planck Institute of Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig. Hello, friends. Well, I, I just have to clarify at the beginning, I will have my master's degrees. <laughs> oh, my mistake. <laughs> I'm on my way. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. So perception can be influenced by many factors, language being one of them. How does language influence the way that we perceive events? Well, um, on many levels, on very many levels. I mean, the most obvious level is, is can be dated actually back to the, to the old Greeks when we talk about rhetoric. So basically how we present um, whatever we're talking about. Um, it begins on the, on the level of words, just simply the words we use and how we use them. Um, can influence how the message we want to perceive, uh, we want to transmit is perceived in the end. So we can just frame one and the same topic in different ways and the receiver will have a different impression. Um, it might be subtle, but there's also um, studies that have found that those effects can actually be rather strong. And if we, if we go, if we dive a bit deeper on the more um, morphological and syntactical level, so basically not the whole words, but like the, the different kinds of past tense of temporal aspect we use, for example, um, then we also find that choosing different um, temporal aspects, for example, can influence how the intentionality of acts is perceived. Like, okay, there was more intention behind that act or, or less. And there were studies that basically um, had participants um, participate in a hypothetical um, legal um, trial. And they, um, they then had to decide whether the described act was first degree or second degree murder. And basically the temporal aspect indirectly influence that. And that's something that is, I think, commonly very unknown and um, is very important because we're talking about first or second degree murder, you know, that's, but yeah, it's not, there's not really much um, scientific light um, on that topic. Absolutely. So it's uh, about whether language can influence perception deeply enough to guide or mislead our judgment in a way that might interfere with legal decisions. That's uh, quite a big theme we're speaking about. So what are the linguistic mechanisms that guide perception? Oh, um, <laughs> again, that's, that's a quite complicated topic uh, in general, but basically, um, when we think about the world, we have different, let's say, semantic categories in our head that are activated or not activated, um, shifted, if you may, and um, also put into context. So on the one hand, we have those semantic categories, which would be words, and how we construct sentences puts them into context. So um, actually the linguistic mechanisms that guide our perception or can influence the perception are all the linguistic mechanisms that are out there. So mm -hmm. range from the words we choose to how we connect them. And yeah, then it goes on, of course, to um, intonation and body language. So is what we say perceived as a threat or just as a 
question or anything like that. So basically, we, we can uh, analyze every level of linguistic um, data uh, and see that it can uh, alter the perception or at least uh, influence influence the perception. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the similarities between philosophical and legal languages? Because obviously ethics and philosophy is something that's going to come into play a lot. Um, and how can those similarities help us bring legal linguistics and neuropsycholinguistics into context? I think that's a very good question. And I um, also think that um, France did a very, very good job in um, sort of introducing us to um, the various um, linguistic aspects at play. Um, and also when we think about um, you know, like what, what language actually is, it's extremely difficult um, for us to define what language is. And also um, in this particular e-talk, when we think about language, law and the brain, um, then, you know, we we'll, might even realize that it's still impossible for us to really pin down what language actually is. What, um, what you said, Katie, about um, this you know, idea of philosophy or generally the, the, the role of philosophy in this whole discussion, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to draw attention to this um, quote by Dworkin, who asked this question. It was also in the, in the description of the, of the talk, where he asked the question, is there truth to be had? Are we contesting what the truth is? That is, in his words, certainly to use a grand phrase, the phenomenology of most lawyers. We read, we puzzle, we puzzle again, and then we come to a judgment. It's a judgment, not a choice. It doesn't feel like a preference. It feels like a judgment about what the truth is. And then he says this um, sentence, I, I guess that got all of us thinking, you know, when preparing the talk. And it's this sentence when he says, um, you know, imagine a judge who's just sentenced the villain to jail or perhaps worse, and then says at the end of his opinion, of course, that's the way I see it. That's my opinion. That's the way I read it. But there are other interpretations and they're equally good. Um, and there, this concept of truth, which of course plays a much bigger role in law than it would do in linguistics. Because whenever you talk about, you know, for instance, in discourse analysis, when you talk to discourse analysts, they would probably refrain from the term truth. They would probably call it something like, um, you know, uh, plausibility. So we're talking about plausibilizing uh, the fact that we, you know, uh, you know, that we're getting reported by different people and it's about plausibilizing uh, potential outcomes. And it's more about how does language capture um, thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, but then again, you know, what is language? Is language just something that sits in the brain and then, um, you know, the brain, I mean, what is the brain? The brain is basically anatomical, it's a biological matter inside a skull, right? And the brain can't really engage with the world, as in the, the brain can't just walk around and perceive the world, but the brain actually stays in there, stays inside the skull and somehow uh, draws on sensations on all the input it gets, right? And sort of makes sense by means of what it gets. So information the brain doesn't get, the brain can't make sense of. Um, then again, I'm not a brain expert. This is why Franz is here. Um, I think the term expert itself is funny because even with so-called experts, it's just our brains that make sense of the world to a certain extent. And you know, I think we should be careful to overstate our own expertise uh, in a field if you know, it might all be down to the brain, you know, who, I think it's a very, very different thing talking about um, expertise and, um, you know, knowledge. It might be two di completely different things. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I can just quickly uh, hop in there, uh, because you mentioned experts and knowledge and truth, um, but also this very important concept in, in the quote you, you said, you cited um, that the judge says, well, this is my interpretation. We very often um, do the error that we think that what experts say is the truth, while actually it's just a very fine-brained 
interpretation and a very well thought through interpretation of whatever the respective experts um, thought about, like all the data that's available to them. And that's why even experts in the same field uh, often come to disagree because it's not the truth. It's just interpretations. Some interpretations are more precise, some are more vague, but in the end, um, yeah, we, we can, I, I think it's very, um, it doesn't matter if it's in, in legal linguistics and philosophy or general linguistics, the term truth is very, very, um, yeah, you have to be cautious when you talk about truth. And that's why I think this, this quote with the interpretations is, uh, is just brilliant. Yeah. And I also think what you're saying about truth, I mean, this is also down to, you know, consciousness really, right? I mean, there might be, diff or there are indeed perhaps different consciousnesses when we think about human beings, when we think about animals, you know, what's, what, what, what is the consciousness when we think of, of caterpillars or when we think of butterflies um, compared yeah. to human beings? I think it's very, this kind of self, the relationship between the self and the world um, that is something where, you know, researchers are still, you know, very interested in this and trying to sort of get more information about this, um, about this relationship, but also about maybe differences between, between species. And, um, you know, when, when we think about legal, legal, um, the workings of the law, legal proceedings, um, there might be more brain in there than, you know, a lot of us, uh, want to admit, um, and I don't mean brain in terms of intelligence, because I do think that um, intelligence and being alive, that's also two very different things. Yeah, so, of course. So when we think about artificial intelligence, for instance, you know, machine does not have to be alive, but can be artificially intelligent. But in order to have consciousness, you need to be alive, right? I don't know. Maybe I'm completely barking up the wrong tree. But... No, I, I agree with you. Very interesting. So uh, just to go back to what you were both talking about, um, about how experts in one field can disagree and how the concept of truth is not something to be played fast and loose with. Um, progress in the field of cognitive science poses important ethical questions to legal practice. So how can people from different fields work together? So people from the legal field, from uh, cognitive sciences, philosophy, for example, or neuroscience, what kind of questions do we need to consider about working together to um, make sure the language that we're using is ethical? Do you want to go first, Daniel, or shall I? Go ahead. I'll, uh, I've got some thoughts as well, but you know, fire away. Um, so cognitive science in general is a very interdisciplinary field. Um, so it's hard to say, okay, there's like the findings of cognitive science and how can we put those into uh, like legal language or in general, our legal system. Um, but I think it's especially this interdisciplinarity in cognitive sciences um, that makes it so interesting, even though it's a little bit harder to grasp. So I think it would be more interesting Thing to, to, um, pers uh, to, to look at it from the other way and be like, what, what would our legal system or our legal language need to know in order to be more precise, more righteous or whatever? And I think that um, when it comes, for example, to, um, and now I'm, I'm lacking the, the vocabulary in English, uh, Gutachten. Like with um, the um, expert reports, I think. Yeah, ah, expert. <laughs> When, when it comes to expert reports and, and stuff like that, uh, it's, um, especially there, it's very important to really have a look at the status quo of, of uh, science, which very often is, is a bit shifted because there's such a big time period between uh, gathering data and gathering knowledge and really getting the knowledge out there in the world. But um, still, yeah, I, I think, those, those findings I, I, I talked about, those studies I talked about before um, are a good example of, of that because I mean, I'm not so very, um, like my knowledge about how the legal system works is, is not um, so deep because it's not my, my let's, field of expertise, but still like saying, okay, let's have a look how 
a certain case was presented to the judge or something, how may that influence the decision and, and stuff like that. And I don't know if that really is um, practiced, but that would be a prime example. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very mm -hmm. good example. I really think this is a very good example because when we think about, you know, like how does sort of um, the brain, how do neurological processes, how does neuroanatomy influence decision-making, for instance, it's not just, um, usually people think about suspects, they think about criminals, they think about behavior during criminal proceedings, behave, behavior before, during or after, for instance, a criminal act. But this, you know, this is, this is old stuff to some extent. I don't mean old stuff shouldn't be researched anymore. Of course it should be researched, but um, what about the judges? What about the prosecutors? What about those people who have, who have power in that system? Those people who make decisions who will and will not be indicted people who make decisions in courtrooms, for instance. So when we think about this, um, this study, um, you know, in, in Israel, there was a study um, where judges were, um, you know, measured based on their, on their, um, on the outcomes of their cases. And it was found that people, um, you know, who did not have a lunch break ruled harsher. They, they gave more, they gave far more harsher rulings than people who did eat. And that, of course, could give a lot of different explanations for this. It could, which I think, uh, Franz, you and me were talking about metabolism and that and and, and things like that. Yeah. But generally, could give all sorts of explanations why this may be the case. But for some reason, it might play a role. There seems to be some kind of connection between also physical well-being of the judge um, and certain decisions, a certain tendency in, in decision making. Now, this is food. This is lunch break. But what about, you know, when we talk about, I don't know, trauma, when we talk about, um, so, you know, brain injury, when we talk about different, uh, you know, different factors that might have an influence on neuroanatomical structure, on a way of thinking, how does, how do these things affect legal decision making? And um, this is the last thing I'll say, I don't want to take up too much time. But I think uh, a, crucial, uh, a crucial way forward would be to not just pathologize the criminals. Of course, if we have particular violent crimes, often these people show, um, you know, a very, very um, large degree of neurodiversity. You know, um, on purpose, not using any particular discriminatory term. A lot of these people are ill, very, very ill. Um, then again, uh, you know, psychological damage or generally um, psychiatric conditions, uh, they are also relevant to the judiciary. Um, and not everyone who has a certain propensity for, uh, you know, a certain type of behavior will act upon that propensity, will act upon this impulse or whatever. Um, but still, we should be aware that when we talk about brain in the legal system, it's not just the suspects, it's not just the defendants and the criminals, it's also professionals. It's also people who work in the justice system. They're not people who are completely outside of that discussion. We like them to be outside because we want fair teachers, fair judges, fair prosecutors. But that's, you know, wishful thinking. At the end of the day, everyone's a human being. Yeah, I think that's that's a very good point to to uh, emphasize the role of all the other parties, except for um, the the suspect and uh, or the yeah the suspect and the victim so also uh, talk about okay how how did the judge feel or behave or whatever in the um, in terms uh, like in, in during the trial for example mm -hmm. um, uh, because in the end uh, every legal trial is a discourse is a communication. There are questions asked, they are answered, and so on and so forth. So, um, 
if we think in terms of pragmatics, so the, the linguistic uh, field of how discourses work and how um, parties in the discourse interact with each other, then of course we have to consider all the parties that are involved. And um, yeah, communication works via language. So basically whatever uh, a suspect may say to the judge might influence how the judge judges in the end. But at the same time, uh, what a judge says to the suspect might trigger and provoke um, this person and provoke a reaction that then in turn uh, sheds a uh, uh, bad light on the person and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it's, it's not only about like suspect victim and, and what they did also, but about all the other aspects of communication that happen in between. Absolutely, yeah, really interesting stuff. And uh, Daniel, a question for you as somebody who's working in the legal field in Austria. Um, why do you think legal linguistics that work neuropsychologically um, are so important in Austria today in the legal field? Very good question, Katie. Thank you for it. Well, the, the answer is, at least from my point of view, that there is just not enough being done in this area. Um, and um, well, of course, I'm very much hoping, Franz, that you will, um, uh, you know, give us some enlightening studies um, in this area. Um, um, at least uh, this is, I think, this is exactly the kind of interdisciplinarity that we need um, at this point. And so, why am I criticizing this? You know, this 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 lack of of, of um, sort of neurolinguistic, psycholinguistic um, uh, research in legal linguistics generally, but, but I must say also in linguistics as such. I think there is not enough done. And there are, of course, researchers such as Susanne Maria Reiter at the University of Vienna um, um, uh, who do amazing stuff when we think about language aptitude um, research, when we think about, you know, working memory, neuroimaging. There is so much stuff um, that is being done and that I think these people can be very proud of because it gives us fantastic new insights uh, into the workings of the brain, insights that people who are not experts in this area, such as myself, you know, we can draw on these insights and, um, and, and you know, sort of reflect our own research in the light of new findings. Um, what my main answer is, um, to your question, Katie, my main answer is that we need um, new studies, neurolinguistic, psycholinguistic studies on the, um, the role of language in the legal system. And I um, know I'm using language now as an indeterminate term. I don't define it, I know. Um, and the reason for this is as well, it's not just my laziness throwing terms around and not defining them, but the reason why I can't define it is because at the end of the day, we don't know what language is. Where does language really sit in the brain? We know there is Broca's area, there's Wernicke's area. We know there is production, there is reception. We do know all this stuff. Um, but what we, what we don't really know is, um, at least this is my, my understanding of it, we, we don't really know how far the influence goes when we talk about neuroanatomic processes when we talk about you know, language processing as such, um, are there other parts of the brain involved? Is it just the specific parts that we see in textbooks? Um, how do these different parts inter, inter, interact? Um, is there something special, um, for instance, to the legal field? Is there any assumption whatsoever you know, to be made about the legal field being special? Uh, you know, um, when we think about moral judgment, juggling morals, thinking about right and wrong, what's good and evil, what's uh, legal and what's not legal. Um, I don't have any, you know, like prefabricated answers, um, but I think that would be, that would be something that, that I personally be very curious about. Also, for instance, uh, the, the, the relationship between trauma and decision-making in the law. Be very mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting about um, trauma and decision making, um, because I know some findings have shown that traumatic brain injury can lead to an underperformance of accuracy um, and reading speed of legal texts. Um, Franz, do you know much about that, specifically um, about traumatic brain injury? 
Well, that, that goes hand in hand with a lot of what Daniel said before. So basically, um, language, like we, we cannot really say what language is exactly because it always it changes uh, according to the question we ask. Uh, when it comes to brain anatomy, um, then we can say that basically language is being processed at different parts of the brain, depending on which aspect of language it is. Mm -hmm. um, this then goes hand in hand with the question how legal language is represented in the brain, because um, so we know uh, that there is a distinction between con concrete words and abstract words. So a concrete word would be like to go, so we can really have a picture in our mind or like cup where we can have the feeling of a cup in our hands, like imagine it. Uh, and then abstract words would be something like freedom. We can try to define freedom, we can describe freedom, but there's no concrete representation, the real word of freedom. And those entities are, if we look at brain scanning studies, uh, activate different areas of the brain. So of course, if there's uh, uh, a lesion in the brain that is mostly responsible for processing abstract terms, then any legal text will be incomprehensible mm -hmm. because it mainly consists of such words. Uh, the same goes also with the complexity of the syntactical complexity that um, very often even for lawyers it's hard to understand legal texts because they're just so so very complex and dense which also there are also findings that at a certain level of complexity uh processing accuracy really suffers and this is something that is not applied in legal texts so um yeah i would say that in, in terms of how can we relate neuro and psycholinguistics and legal linguistics that would be a first point to say like okay is our legal texts actually comprehensible for the normal brain and um yeah i mean i think there's not really a way to go around the uh, whole abstractness because the law is something abstract that we as, as a human species came up with so it's not like we cannot we cannot transfer it to some other words that would be graspable, um, so to say. We can, but that's also the reason why we very often work with metaphors, because they, uh, they facilitate um, our understanding of complex and, and abstract um, concepts. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point. Um, also, when we think about, you know, um, when, I, when, I, when I was writing my diploma thesis um, under the supervision of Henry Widowson, um, you know, so, uh, that I was thinking about, you know, like how does the law do this? Like how does it, um, how does it turn into something, you know, concrete? Um, and when we, you know, think about like these abstract commands, I mean, basically we all have these sort of the set, set of principles. You know, I mean, I call them nomemes. We can call them anything else. Just the, the, the word that. Um, that I found, and I and I, it's used elsewhere in, in typology of proper names. This is not what I mean. I mean like no memes, as in a set of abstract categories. That these sort of what 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 Franz was saying when he was talking about freedom. You can't touch freedom. You can't grasp it. Really, it's just like it's it's fun that, for instance, very 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 um, specific but abstract terms are the most difficult to 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 grasp, um, fully understand, fully grasp. Um, so we have the abstract, we have the kind of you know, really complex, and then we have the specific uh, linguistic realization. So for instance, you have this abstract idea, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't kill someone, you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't kill anyone out there, you shouldn't. Um, but then it's the law that turns it into the imperative, you shall not kill. Um, and so we have, we do have this difference between no memes, abstract categories of social prescription, and norms, legal norms, norms that are actually in the shape of language. And what I'll be very interested in is what happens in legal interpretation when people make sense of legal documents. You were touching upon this, Franz, earlier um, when you were talking about complexity, because a lot of people nowadays give us the impression there are these bad legal texts, and if only we change the legal texts, then, you know, all is well. 
But the problem is, it's not just the text. I really believe it is not just the text. And I can also argue, not just in terms of belief, but in terms of rational argumentation, that it is human beings who make sense of texts. And it's the human brain that codes and decodes linguistic science and that it's a negotiation. And I was um, also listening in preparation for our talk to various TED talks. Um, I can't remember now who said it, but I think this is a very, very good, is a very, very good, good point to make that actually we're all living in an illusion. Our brain creates an illusion and reality is what, um, you know, is, is basically the illusions we agree on. Um, and what, well, I think if we talk about statutory interpretation, it's basically upholding these illusions, upholding sort of the determinacy of the world. The world is indeterminate. We can never fully know. Um, but what we can know is that we make sense of the world, which is why we should look at this more closely. Absolutely. So something that um, came to my mind, uh, obviously, both Daniel and Franz, both of you are multilingual. Um, how important do you think it is um, to communicate with people in your field who are speakers of different languages? Because um, as you were speaking about Franz, um, different studies found that using perfective or imperfective past tenses or different temporal aspects could really have an effect. And obviously those aspects differ across languages. Um, have you found that it's useful to uh, be multilingual in a field like that? Um, well, um, I mean, I, as a linguist, think that being multilingual is always useful. <laughs> no, but uh, I wanted to, to um, mention it actually before that when you ask Daniel why it is important in Austrian legal linguistics to incorporate neurolinguistics, um, is actually that basically all the, the, the few papers you find out there that really uh, tackle this problem or this, it, this topic um, are in English and mm -hmm. tackle the English language. So in, in English, we have the progressive and the, the per perfective and imperfective form. In German, we don't really have that. So basically all the knowledge that I've like, gained from those papers, I cannot really apply them to the German language because the temporal aspect is realized differently. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it would make sense to know such differences. Of course, you can never know all the languages in the world because there are just too many. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's a great hobby to learn languages. and It doesn't hurt you, so just do it. But um, <laughs> it also has some advantages if you um, work in these fields because then you might get some insights into how a person that the person you interact with uh, interprets something or um, perceives something that maybe you um, wouldn't have gotten uh, if there was this language barrier. Mm -hmm. And also I think that uh, especially when, when it comes to, to like legal trials, that it is very important to try to communicate with the people in their language or let them express in their language because it's always something different to express yourself in your, your mother language or your first language uh, or a, a second or third or whatever number language, you know, because um, it's just very often that you think about something and you just don't know how to express it. I mean, that can also happen in your first language, but in your first language, it's less likely depending on the circumstance. So um, that's, that's a very important thing. Yeah, I think you're also raising a very good point that um, when we think about asylum procedures, so, um, you know, people who are invoking their right to be treated as refugees um, and, you know, therefore, you know, the, the apply for asylum, for instance, here in Austria. I mean, there is an awful lot of, of horrible things going on there, and I'm not going to go into detail there because I know that the, um, the authorities are very, very... Um, you know, interested in the opinions of legal linguists in that area. Um, I find it worrying that, um, especially when we talk about vulnerable individuals, um, what Franz, what you were touching upon, you know, this, this um, sort of, sometimes this problem of not being able to put something into words, even in your first language, 
you know, and it might even happen in this very talk that, you know, one of us wants to say something, but we can't just think of the very, very right word to, to, to express what we're trying to say. Now, how do you think someone feels uh, in a criminal trial, what a, as a suspect, as a, as a victim, as a victim, for instance, in sexual violence case, how does someone feel in, in asylum proceedings, you know, when we are in front of the, we call them enchaida here, like the, the decision makers. Uh, and, um, you know, people are being asked questions about, you know, what exactly, where did you live? Where exactly did you live? How far was your house from this and that person? Um, you know, so how did you get here? Was it over Greece? Did you go to Italy first? Where did you go then? And so on and so forth. Um, and I know actually from my own time when I was a student representative, um, working with the student representative's office um, at the Department of English, that uh, people uh, who did seek uh, my help in uh, cases like that uh, were extremely overwhelmed uh, with the language question in asylum proceedings. Uh, and we need to keep in mind, and this is, this, this is you know, how this sort of is linked up to the brain topic, these people are often traumatized. Some of them were raped. Some of them had uh, horrible experiences on their way to Europe. Uh, leaving aside uh, right-wing populism, calling them murderers and rapists and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, this should be said as well, that like those victims that sort of uh, are looking uh, in most cases, you know, there are always, there are always negative examples but the majority of them are completely normal people. Um, some of them though um, might have suffered uh, different trauma, might have suffered from um, you know, adversarial, um, adversarial uh, uh, factors and they arrive here and then they wake up in a very strict legal system uh, when we think about asylum proceedings. So in a nutshell, um, there is not enough done there and uh, I don't think that uh, this will change in the near future also because in part people are afraid of what they might find. Um, you know, and, and I, I also think it's deeply worrying that, uh, especially in right-wing discourse, we find, you know, we just find this tendency that, for instance, um, you know, it's okay to deport people because they're framed as a threat to the state, a threat to the public. Uh, when in fact, we might even have more violent uh, and surely do have more violent perpetrators living among us, living in our midst. Uh, and uh, for those people, we are sort of trying to, uh, you know, um, find alternative solutions like therapy instead of punishment, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, apparently justice is only for some people, but not for others. I don't know. Very well said, Daniel. <laughs> so I suppose um, to expand on what you were saying, it's uh, the indeterminacy of the human experience and behaviour is obviously something that affects legal practice, kind of moving more away from the brain, but just our own experiences. Um, how do you feel that affects legal practice? I think that um, life is indeterminate. Um, I have a sip of water, sorry. That's okay. I don't think there is such a thing as determinate life. You never know, you know, if you like, you leave the house, whether a brick will hit you in the face. So it is, it is possible. Um, and of course, I hope it won't happen. But but if it does, then there we have uh, the indeterminacy of life. Um, now, but in all seriousness. Um, the indeterminacy of the human experience, you know, indeterminacy exists everywhere. We have psychological indeterminacy. We have geographical indeterminacy. We have all these different types of indeterminacy. Quantum physics, you know, if we, we have all these theories of what, what, what they are, quantum and all that, but, but the moment we look at them, there's something entirely different, or they behave completely differently. So um, we wish to have a very well-defined, restricted um, sense of what it means to be human. But um, very often we're sort of, this is thrown in our face that being human is so much more than what we anticipated it to be. Um, 
And this sounds very philosophical, I'm aware of that, but um, I think that we shouldn't forget about um, you know, why human beings arrive at certain expectations, you know, like uh, they're not just there, they're, they are to a large extent um, culturally constructed. Um, the question really is, at least this is this is also what Dworkin repeatedly um, refers to, and I think this is also like another, I, I really like Dworkin for his quotes, you know, some, some things he said just get you thinking, whether you agree with him or not, you just, you just start thinking about things, because he says, or must we finally accept that at bottom, in the end, philosophically speaking, there is no real or objective or absolute or foundational fact of the matter or right answer truth about anything, that even our most convic our confident convictions about what happened in the past or what the universe is made of or who we are or what is beautiful or who is wicked or just um, are just our convictions just ideology, just badges of power, just the rules of the language games we choose to play, just the product of our irrepressible disposition to deceive ourselves that we have discovered out there in some ex external, objective, timeless, mind-dependent world, what we have actually invented ourselves out of instinct, imagination, and culture. This is, you know, sort of work in also criticizing this idea that it's all socially constructed. And I do not think it's all socially constructed. I think the brain plays a large part. The brain is sort of the basis of these social constructs. If we think about legal organizations, Katie, because you were asking about the legal context and I seem to be you know, sort of uh, digressing a bit, but going back to the legal context, what is the prosecution service? What's the court? It's Yes, a building, it's robes, it's clothes, it's, you know, a lot of non-linguistic, extra-linguistic stuff. But then you could also think of it as a bundle of genes, you know, people's genes. Can you think of an organization as the sum of its genes, all the genes of th these people being activated or not activated, you know, who knows? Can you think of it as, you know, the sum of linguistic practice discursive practices, what people choose to do, what they choose not to do. Um, I don't think you can, you know, um, pin it down to any of them. I don't think it's, it's, it's not neither nor, um, it's all of that at once. And that makes it so difficult and so complex. Um, I don't have like a really good answer. Um, you know, how much is brain? How much is culture? You know, this nature nurture discussion. I don't have an answer to that, but who, who says it's not both? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, uh, Sir Patrick Bateson uh, released a book a few years ago, um, essentially saying it, it really is a ridiculous uh, thing to pit against each other, nature or nurture, because they're so um, intertwined. <laughs> yeah. So, um, unless there was anything else that our speakers would like to add, um, I think we'll wrap up here. Uh, was there anything else that anyone wanted to add before we wrap up? Well, maybe I, I have also uh, uh, just recently read a few lines which I thought are just perfect for sort of, uh, this, this topic mm -hmm. uh, from Manuel Cruz from 2004. And, and he wrote, um, philosophy thus uh, benefits from history and ambiguity by imperfection of language. Uh, but philosophy uh, further benefits from another ambiguity its own one. Since Frege, uh, we know that meaning and reference do not necessarily coincide, uh, but it has to be agreed that in general terms, the major words of the language of philosophy, and we can also apply that for the language of uh, uh, the legal language. Mm -hmm. So the major words of the language of philosophy, such as uh, freedom, being, uh, dignity, history, wrong or right, uh, don't have assignable references for entities that do not show ambiguity. Uh, the question, what do philosophical or, in our case, legal texts talk about, finds its most just answer in the formulation about words. And where do words and human language originate from? Basically from the interaction between both nerve cells in the brain, but also the interaction between brains. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just, I just read that and I thought like, okay, this, this is just perfect for, for this talk.
<laughs> yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, when we think about, you know, the, the this is this old discussion between um, cause and effect. I mean, there are people out there who who argue that life, all of it, you know, is just the relationship between set preconditions and sort of the effect that these bring forward. And if we think about, um, you know, what this, I mean, if we think about now going back to the, to the trauma discussion, brain trauma, um, traumatic uh, injury, does this mean if someone has an accident and turns from a lovely neighbor into a murderous beast, that that person can, in a way, you know, defend themselves in court by arguing it was their brain who did it. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> I don't, you know, and this is what, what I think this is why what, what Franz was talking about is so relevant because you know what what i i personally i wouldn't accept the defense if i was a judge i'm not i'm in research i'm not a judge but if i was a judge i would not i would not accept that because where do you draw the line how much injury do we have to have in a in a case for the injury to lead to um to to that defense being successful i think it's very, it's very difficult. Some people think about, you know, um, it's like God and the law. Now, why would I bring up God? We don't know whether God exists. We don't know. Um, and above all, we don't know because there are people, different religions who pin down, you know, God as a, as a personal figure. So like a man or like a woman or non-binary doesn't matter um but god is in the law um because you swear i swear by god you know to tell nothing but the truth and so on and so forth so when we talk about things like i don't know i think there's a new there's a new field i can't remember i think it's something like neurotheology and i'm interested in that because i'm interested in questions that you know, if we think about morals, self-control, will, these things are extremely relevant to legal systems. Whether there is a God or not, let's leave God out of it. But, but these things such as, is there at least in part self-control, free will, things like that, is really relevant to legal discussions too, because the whole criminal law, the whole criminal law, is down to one word, um, and that is intent or no intent. There doesn't have to be intent. You can still be punished. But intent is, in a lot of criminal acts, uh, a, necess a necessity. It, it has to be there in order to commit this particular act. Can you, um, can you, can you, can you um, defend yourself? by saying, well, it was just the biological precondition, well, it was just my neuroanatomy? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I must say, I personally don't think that it's a good approach in general to say like, okay, there's me and there's my brain. And because that's obviously interrelated. I mean, of course, changes to the brain chain can change your personality and stuff. But that for me is an indicator that actually you are your body and like i i wouldn't also uh, I, I would not make a distinction between your body and your brain mm -hmm. uh, i think that's that's actually a fallacy that, that we divide that and, and say like okay there's the brain and there's the mind and then there's the body and stuff um so that's why i would say like a defense like okay it's my brain that did that uh, of course you are to most parts your brain uh, plus how it behaves or how you behave in the given circumstances. And yeah. It's a very difficult one. Katie, do you remember the research project that we were on? Well, I do. At the, at the execution um, application letters. 
I mean, that would be an interesting that would be an interesting um, outlook on things. You know, what would we have found if we had conducted interviews with these, and what would we, would we have found if we had neuro um, imaging involved? Absolutely, would we have different brains. I don't know. You know, it's just a random thought that hit me just then. Um, yeah. No, I, I sense a new research project in the future for us based on that. I don't know whether we'll get the funding for, for this project. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, and uh, I think the, the, ap the, the, the applicants of, of 1938 might, might be very rare today. <laughs> <laughs> might be difficult to get them in an MRI machine. <laughs> Probably, Perfect. <yeah. laughs> Great. Well, Daniel Franz, thank you so much for speaking today. It's been a really interesting discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone who's watched live. Uh, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you'd like to rewatch or share, the video will be available on the AAL website. That's oegrl.com um, very shortly. So thank you again for attending and goodbye. <laughs>